Okay. Well, hey, Doug, it's really good to uh, see you all that's here this morning. Uh, praise the Lord and uh, trust that you are, are keeping well uh, spiritually and physically. This morning is our last message regarding ecclesiology, at least for this round anyway. Our, our look at the church. Uh, last week we were considered uh, the victory that the church has. We are the healthy church is a victorious church, and we looked at various ways in which we have the, a victory. Where Jesus said, "You know, in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world." What a great victory! A victory over the world. You know, many there over the centuries there have been many powerful people who have tried to take over the world. <laughs> you think of various uh, dictators and powerful leaders back in history. They had enormous armies and enormous firepower, and they wanted to take over the world. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting concept of, of conquest. And of course, we have a great enemy, uh, and a supernatural enemy in in, the, in Satan and, and Lucifer, as he's often known. And he, he was the first conqueror. He was the first one to set out a conquest to take over the world. And uh, he, he has it because he had allegiance given to him from our first parents, Adam and Eve. Um, but Jesus says, you know, uh, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so it's Jesus. Um, he's the one that we are looking forward to who will do the, the great takeover, not just taking over, but he's taking back. And first of all, he's, he's working through the church. And that's where we look at ecclesiology, the study of the church. And we are, we are in a victorious, uh, privileged position in Christ. The book of Romans says, if God be for us, who can be against us? And that's, and that's an incredible, powerful statement to remind us and to encourage us as true believers of our victory in Christ. We are a victorious church. This message is to look at this morning of how, by becoming a member, a true member of the body of Christ, the church, what is the personal and eternal significance for you? And that's the title of our message, uh, the last one, as we look at ecclesiology, the personal, eternal significance of the church. It's personal, it's eternal, and it has great significance. Okay. Now, this message also, we now furthermore overlap the Bible's teaching not only about the church, the Bible's teaching about the church, but also the Bible's teaching about salvation. It's personal, it's eternal, and there is great significance. It has significant life-changing aspects of what happens when a person joins the true church of Jesus Christ. And we're thinking of the healthy theme, the healthy church, the, the health of the church. Remember the first one, healthy home, healthy church. What are the significant health benefits? There's much in the world today about health, isn't there? Looking after health and understanding health. We understand so much more today about uh, looking after ourselves and, and health and so much more during this time of a very powerful microscopic little virus. Uh, we have been, been mindful of our health, but what are the significant spiritual health benefits that occur in your life, any person's life, when joining the church, which is built on truth. We're going to bring up the screen now and look at our Bible verse to get, get started. And we're reading from John's Gospel, 
chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. And it reads here, Jesus speaking, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold, which is another way of talking about the, the, the church, a place of, of safety, does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way. That man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him. This is the church, beautiful picture of the church with the relationship to the shepherd, a Christ savior. For they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, speaking of the, all the Pharisees and all the religious leaders. They're just like thieves and robbers. They, they were stealing people away, stealing sheep away from the good shepherd, the true garden of 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 the bible and of their covenant through moses but the sheep did not listen to them i am the door if anyone enters by me he will be saved and here's a good healthy part will go in and out and find pasture abundant life the the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy i came that they may have life and have it abundantly amen let's pray father god yes we thank you and praise you this morning that through your son the lord jesus christ he has given us abundant life he has saved us and protected us from the one who only steals and kills and destroys our soul we thank you that our loving savior has shown us the way through the door which is him and now we are in the sheepfold it's like we are in the ark of noah and uh, we are safe we are saved we have we are being preserved for the one who loved us and died for us lord may your word bless us this morning may the uh, biblical points of this message how it, the the significance great significance that is both personal and e eternal to us individually may that be a blessing to us as we consider these beautiful truths about the body of christ the church may you be glorified and all that is said and done right now and uh, may you just hide me in the shadow of your cross once more so you can receive all the glory. May you just shine forth off our computer screens or our TV screens or our phone screens this morning. May your glory just radiate uh, from your word and may we be strengthened. May we be encouraged uh, to walk with you as we've just read that he is the one that goes before us and the sheep follow and uh, we know his voice. We know his leading because he speaks the word of truth. And you have made us, the church, to be people of the truth. And so, Lord, we want to hear you loud and clearly this morning, what you're speaking to us. We thank you for our uh, look last week of the, the victory, the victorious, healthy church that is in Christ. And now may we consider a great personal eternal significance of being members of the body of christ bless us now we ask and pray in jesus name amen amen
So first, to become part of the church, first things first, you can't run before you can walk. First, to become part of the church in these verses that Jesus was giving the illustration and spiritual truths, a person must enter through the door. You must enter through the front door of the church. And that front door is the Jesus of the Bible. He's the true Jesus of the Gospels, the one who takes away sins and makes restoration and reconciliation back to God. That's at the front door of the church. And often it's been said that the door is, is, has got a great, wonderful cross uh, that constitutes what the door is, the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no alternative side door. There's no back door uh, into the sheepfold, into the true church. No, we must come through the door, and that door is Jesus Christ. See if he, re, he Jesus says here on these verses, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. It doesn't say he might be saved, or it's possible. It could be. We'll see how we go. No, Jesus makes this very emphatic statement, as he does. The way he speaks, the way he lectures spiritual truth to his audiences. He says, if anyone, anyone, Jew or Gentile, Chinese or uh, South African or whatever, anyone who enters by me, he will be saved. And on top of that, will go in and out and find pasture. Just need to make sure everybody's got their mute um, button on there. It's good to have some feedback uh, from the audience. So praise the Lord for that. <laughs> but you will go in and find pasture. This is good, eternal, healthy significance, personally for you and for me. Jesus makes it very clear. It is a Pacific, a very Pacific door. It's not an ordinary door. There's, there's one that is genuinely only the true door. Don't want to go through the wrong door. <laughs> you end up going into the wrong room. <laughs> You've got to go through the very door that is specified in the Bible to enter the church, to enter into this beautiful ecclesiology. From Luke's gospel, chapter 13, 24, Jesus says this, strive, strive to enter through the narrow door. It's not a wide door. It's a narrow path, which relates well to when Jesus was talking about the narrow path or the narrow gate. Many are on the broad way. Many are on living on the broad path that, that goes through a broad gate, but it only leads to destruction. But narrow is the way, and narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. And so Jesus says here from Luke's gospel that strive to enter. Make sure, make every effort that the door that you're going through to find that relationship with God, make sure you, it is the right door. It is, an, it is a specified narrow door. In other words, there is not multiple choices. There's, there's, uh, it's, it's, it's narrow in that it is, you could say it's a, it's a tight entrance way, but it must be found. It must, you must go through it. You must force your way into it in that sense. There's a, there's a struggle, you know, to get through the door. There's a struggle, and that struggle is against evil. It's a struggle against things that are untrue about God. That's very popular today, and many people are lapping it up and accepting it. And, and uh, I fear for even uh, our day and age in which there are, there are many false churches, and they have a very wide door and say, yeah, everybody, come on in. Come on, this is, we make it, it's easy. It's an easy way in. You just come and, yeah, well, you know, just, yeah, okay. So you, you know that there is a Jesus and there's a God and, yeah, come on in. That's, that's good enough. That'll do. 
And it's very easy to get through those kind of doors. But Jesus says the true door is actually tough. It's tough spiritually because we have to accept that we are sinners. And people don't like to hear that. They would rather have another way saying that God loves everyone and you just come as you are and God accepts you and uh, you don't need to change. You just be yourself. And, and that's, very, that's a very wide door. It's easy to go through that kind of door. It's very accepting. But Jesus makes it clear, no, no, the, the true door is very narrow. It's, just, it's hard to get through. It's hard to get your head around. It's, it's hard to accept. Jesus says, carries on in Luke 13 here, for many, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and not be able. They will seek, they will, they will want what God's offering, but they won't be able because they will trip up and they will stumble at the truth of the cross and what that means. It means that we need forgiveness because we have done wrong. And, and I'm not willing to accept that. I don't think so. I'm not that bad. I'm a moral person, don't you know? Don't you know? I've been to church all my life. I've been, I've been thus, I've been doing this. And, and uh, so many people will seek it, but will not be able to. So that's the first things first. But now, once a person does go through the true door, that is Jesus Christ, one who has strived and gone through the narrow gateway, now there is personal and wonderful significance. Jesus says he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. There is liberty. There is an abundance of life and goodness that is though that is made available to those that have come through the front door of the true church. I got five quick, beautiful takeaways for us this morning that God's laid on my heart. Of, of personal eternal significance of being part of the true church, a healthy church, a victorious church in Jesus Christ. The first eternal significance, which is personal to you, upon entering through the door of the church, which is Jesus Christ, the door, is that you are baptized. You are baptized by God through the Holy Spirit, and that is personal to you. God makes you his by baptizing you by the Holy Spirit. This is an eternal baptism. It has come from eternity because God is in eternity. He is in time past, and he's in time present, and he's in time future. There is no limits of, of his eternal presence. It is eternal. And the baptism that he offers, is, its purposes are forever. Look at these wonderful words from Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink. All were made to drink of one spirit. Notice the unity of oneness that is in this baptism by the spirit. One spirit, we're baptized into one body. There's beautiful, perfect unity and of great significance to you personally this morning. That you in God, you have now in that sense are made to belong. And we all love to belong to something. And we belong to the true church of Jesus Christ. And it's a wonderful thing that the Spirit has done for us. He's baptized us into the body. And it doesn't matter about earthly separations. In, these, in this verse, the, the things of general separation that are common in Paul's day was that there is separation between Jews and Greeks or Jews and Gentiles, which means a separation between Jews and, and every other people on the face of the earth. That's a, that was a cultural separation common in those days. And also a common cultural class separation in, in community and society in those days was those that were slaves 
and those that were free. It's a bit like saying those that were wealthy and those that were poor. They were class separations. And Paul is saying here in, in, in another verse elsewhere in, in Paul's writing, he even includes male and female, that there were separate cultural separations between males and females. But here, this verse of personal significance is that no matter what the earthly, worldly separations are or were, it doesn't matter. Because in Christ, we have all been baptized by one spirit into one body. So here we are baptized, the personal significance. We are baptized by the spirit to join or become a member of only one body. There's not two bodies or three bodies to, to choose from. It's not any, meeny, miny, mo. Which one do I want? No, it's just one. And God does that baptism. This is not to be confused with the baptism by water. That's a different baptism. That's something that we do. But this baptism is something that God does. And it's not to be confused with the baptism that happened on the day of Pentecost uh, in Acts chapter 2. That's the, that was the enablement of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and disciples on that day to begin the ministry of the church, have been empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's not talking about that kind of baptism, um, but being baptized with the Holy Spirit. This has been baptized by the Holy Spirit to be put into the body. So you cannot become a member of the body of Christ unless you have personally, eternally been baptized by the, by the Holy Spirit and placed into the body. And this is something of great significance that happens to every person who enters through the true door of the church, the front door, which is Jesus Christ. Drink in for eternal good health. It says, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Drink to eternal good health. One true spirit each believer united together in one body with the Lord Savior. It's the same spirit. This then speaks of our true membership. Like I said, you cannot become a member of the church unless the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the true church and the true body. You know, many people join memberships don't they these days there's, me there's memberships for everything you know you've got gym memberships <laughs> you've got uh, car club memberships you've got um, business memberships perhaps uh, online um, memberships uh, you name it there's a membership for everything but this is a special eternal significant membership become to join the membership of of the church the body of christ and membership has privileges maybe think of something that you are a member of there are privileges aren't there of being a member uh, people who are not a member can't enjoy what what the members enjoy of of whatever organization that you may be a member of uh, if you're not a member of that organization, you're considered an outsider. You know, you, you, haven't, you haven't paid for your membership uh, subscription or whatever it is. You know, there are privileges. And uh, our membership, our membership into the church has been paid for, not by us, but our membership's been paid for by Jesus. And uh, he's given us great significant membership privileges let's look at a few of them let's carry on number two you receive an eternal guarantee we love guarantees we are consumers let's think about that for a moment ephesians chapter 1 13 to 14 says here in him it's in christ you also when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, 
and believed. That's important, folks. You just didn't hear the word of truth, the gospel. A lot of people hear it, but not many people believe it. And that's a very sad thing because you believed in him. And when that happened, you were sealed. Now, that word believe means to trust, to trust fully and place your allegiance on him who the gospel speaks about. When that happened, and only when that happened, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. You were, you were marked out by God for him. Now that he knows you and recognizes who you are in Christ, and it was done by the Holy Spirit. What does it say? What does it about say about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Members of the body of Christ have an inheritance that is promised and it is guaranteed by the Holy Spirit until it guaranteed our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The eternal and personal significance of being a member of the church is that you have been given an inheritance and it has been guaranteed. Wow. Often the, the guarantee joke of, of life. I know you know this one. Things that you can guarantee about life. There is death and there are taxes. Guaranteed. Well, that's not exactly quite true, because for the Christian, we have been given an eternal guarantee, a guarantee of an inheritance. Guarantees are very powerful. They become a legal concept. You know, you've all heard of the, uh, the money back guarantee. If you purchase this product, and uh, you purchase, uh, you know, within such and such a time, we, we, we guarantee your money back. If you are not completely satisfied or if there's any fault or something wrong with the product, we have a money back guarantee. Now that becomes legal. It's an issue of law. If that guarantee is, is not kept, you take that company to court and, um, you know, the, the legal system will sort it out. They will get prosecuted and, and fined uh, heavily uh, for, for uh, breaking their, their promise of guarantee. And, and consumers, uh, the, particularly, you know, the way we are, we are, we are great. We are, we are consuming everything today. We are real consumers. We, we like to have guarantees because guarantees are like an insurance. Guarantees are... Uh, uh, give us a, a, an insurance and they give us an assurance that if I buy this product, um, there's no risk. There's, there's little risk. If something goes wrong, I can take it back and I can get my, my money back. So we love guarantees. When a, when a person joins the church, however, by entering through the front door, the only door, we receive freely a guarantee without, a, without any payment that we've made, we are still given this guarantee. And this is, this is the graciousness and mercy of God. Do we deserve that guarantee? Have we lived an exemplary life that makes us deserve a guarantee even as a Christian? No, by no means we haven't. And yet this promise has been made by God and it has been given us in the form of the Holy Spirit until that time that we acquire full possession of the inheritance, which is in Christ. We haven't, we, it's like we have it now, but we haven't, we're not yet at that point of fully enjoying it. It's something off in, in, the, in future time. But until then, it is guaranteed. It cannot be taken away from us. And we don't deserve this. But this is how God operates. It's an incredible, personal, eternal significance by entering in 
to the true church, the true body of Christ. You know, put it to you like this. Imagine if during this COVID time, which we're going through, imagine if the COVID-19, particularly this, call it the Delta, imagine if there was a 100% guarantee of a vaccination that was guaranteed that you would not get the virus. Guaranteed. Guaranteed it would work. And the guarantee goes like this. If for any reason that this vaccine did not work in your case, then the government would guarantee a payment to you of $1 million. That was the guarantee. So take this vaccine. It's guaranteed to work. If for any reason it does not work, you would be guaranteed a payment of $1 million. Now, do you think people would be racing to get the, to get the COVID vaccine jab right now if that was the case? You betcha they would because of the guarantee. In fact, unfortunately, it would become corrupted because people would receive the vaccine and then they would go out of their way to try and get the, uh, the virus so they could claim the $1 million. That's how people would operate. So guarantees are very powerful. Guarantees are very motivating, particularly in our consumer uh, type of culture in which we live today. I think it's in a funny, ironic way that when God made this guarantee, it was almost as though he had consumers like you and me in mind when he made it. Because we love to have a guarantee. There's, there's no risk to the purchaser or to the one who receives the goods. It's uh, very, very powerful. So this is a very powerful, eternal significance uh, to you and to me as members of the body of Christ. We have a true gospel. We have a true savior, Jesus Christ. We have a true church. And now we have a true guarantee. Let me ask you this. Do other religions of the world offer the same guarantee to their followers? No, they don't. They just say, oh, you, you might get eternal life. Oh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, this depends, you know, are you, have you been really good or, you know, uh, do, do, does your good works outweigh the, the bad works? Uh, there's no guarantee. No other religion offers a guarantee like this that we can trust and put our belief in. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That is personal, eternal significance like no other. Praise the Lord for that. That's ecclesiology and its finest. We've given a guarantee. Let's look at our first, our third takeaway. So number two, we had the, the true guarantee of life. Number three now, we receive gifts. It's like, but wait, there's more. Not only have you been given a guarantee, but you've also been given free gifts to take away. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 12 here. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. That's everyone who's a believer, that is. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. You personally receive gifts by God, spiritual gifts, according to the will of the Holy Spirit. And these gifts are really given so that you can be a blessing to others. Not only are you being blessed, but you are being used by God to be a blessing to the other members of this beautiful organization called 
the church of Jesus Christ, the body. You have been enabled to function, to function well in the new sealed and guaranteed life. It's almost like God designed the significance of true membership again with consumers in mind. Not only has he offered a guarantee, but now he's offering free gifts to take away and use as well. You would think that more people would want and gladly receive all that God is giving away freely. Let's put it like this. Was salvation free? Yes, it was. Was the guarantee and promise given freely? Yes, it was. And now are they gifts, the spiritual gifts and the endowment that has granted and blessed you? Has that, did you have to pay for that, if anything? No, no, that came freely as well. This is incredible, eternal, personal significance of the grace of God just by becoming a member of the true body of Christ. We love guarantees. There's no risk when the guarantee is given. We even love giving, receiving gifts that are somehow going to uh, add some betterment to our lives. We love receiving things that are free. And thirdly, uh, we, we love things. Yeah, not only do we, 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 we love the guarantees, we love the betterment of the gifts, and we love that the membership is free also. Welcome to God's department store of gifts. You can read in your own time all the various gifts that are mentioned in this chapter 12. But they're all empowered by the one and same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. If we were to read on a little bit down into verse 11 of the same chapter, um, we must be careful that we don't make up what these gifts are according to our own imagination. No, they've been very uh, clearly and carefully specified what the true gifts are. Unfortunately, today we have much false gifts around us. People have made up their own uh, imaginations and ideas of what the gifts of the Holy Spirit are. Like, you know, I've, I've, I've got, a, uh, I got a gift to perform such and such a task on the, on the sports field, for example. Or I've got a, a gift of the Holy Spirit uh, to, to do something else. Um, got to be careful what we... Uh, understand and, and this is we've looked at it, this type of topic uh, other times but the point is don't allow the imagination to get you carried away in what you think are spiritual the true spiritual gifts because a lot of the spiritual gifts that are talked about today are for my benefit what's in it for me it's for me myself and I but this verse that we're looking at on the screen is very clearly says that to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good, for the common betterment and blessing of the members, other members of the true body of Christ. It's not what's in it for me. It's what's in it for everybody else. How God through the spirit wants to use me and, and uh, that I can function well in his body by being a member of his church because i've entered through his door it's all of him and it's not of me and it's not what's in it for me but it's what's in it for the church that is the true mindset the true spiritual mindset around how these gifts of the holy spirit should be operating but nevertheless the eternal personal significance is that you have been given gifts. And uh, it's a great, great significance of eternal betterment and, and power that has been granted freely to us again. But 
do so, do these, do this particular area again with careful examination and God's word around this particular topic. Because point number four is that you've been given a commission of great eternal significance. Let's read from Matthew chapter 28, 19 to 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, says Jesus. And behold, I, that's Jesus, I am with you always to the end of the age. What a great commission. Number one, you've received a baptism from God. Number two, you've received a guarantee of inheritance from God, promised and sealed through the Holy Spirit. Number three, you have received gifts that enable you to function well in the new sealed and guaranteed life. And number four, those gifts should work towards the great commission. You have received a commission from Jesus to go, go and make disciples of all nations. He wants the church to be doing something until he returns. Not just having a party and a celebration and those things are nice at various times, but that's not what the church is about. He wants us to be doing something with the things that he's freely given to us so that those free things are not wasted. He wants you and I, he wants the members to make his name known throughout all the earth. This is not the great option. It's the great commission. Eternal personal significance. Jesus has given you something to do. He's given you a great purpose in life that nothing else can compare to. To be part of his plan to be part of his mission in the world. Wow, what an incredible eternal thing to be a part of God's working power throughout all the ages, throughout all history. The true church has been doing this because of all the free things that the members have been given. Number five, the eternal personal significance that has been given to you, a member of the true church of Jesus Christ, is that your name is written down in heaven. Philippians 4.3, an example of this, Paul speaking to this church, he says, yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Is your name written down in glory this morning? Has God written your name down in the book of life? When the pages are opened, will your name be found there? It will be if you've gone through the front door, the only door into the church of Christ. Number one, you received a baptism. Number two, you received a guarantee of inheritance. Number three, you received free gifts that enable you. Number four, you received a commission from Jesus. Number five, you have your name written down in heaven. The eternal personal significance of being the church of Jesus is that your name, your name, what does your name stand for this morning? So your name is written down in heaven. It's in a book that's called the book of life. You know, sometimes people may forget you. You ever, you ever experience that? You feel, oh, people just, people just start thinking about me. I don't, I feel a bit left out. They may, for, people may even forget your name. I'm, I'm terrible at forgetting people's names. I, you know, I'm sure you've experienced that too. You meet somebody for the first time and two minutes later, you've forgotten their name already. God doesn't forget your name. 
God doesn't forget about you because he's put your name into his book of life. Wow, isn't that wonderful? God doesn't forget about you. It doesn't matter if we're in lockdown or we're not in lockdown. All those things, there's no limitations. Nothing gets in the way of what God has done and what God has freely given. I was remembering, reflect on what Arnold was saying earlier in the service, you know, the salt and the life, the salt of the earth, the salt and the light of the, of the earth. That's uh, something that's only been given to the true church. Uh, God's work carries on, but God has not forgotten you. Your name is written in the book of life. And that book of life is a book of eternity, of personal significance to you. Your life, you as a person, you are significant to God this morning for all eternity as a member of his body because you've gone through the front door. Let's finish here. Think of this beautiful verse of what Paul had to say about the significance of the church. And I know I've read this and used this verse many times, but it's so uh, adept for this topic. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Of the five power points this morning, that's work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for all time, forever and ever. Now, there's no, that's no limit to time now. All generations, all time, but now, not only in time, but for all eternity. Personal, eternal significance forever and ever. Amen. So think upon our ecclesiology. It asks the question, what is the church? And I hoped over the last uh, number of weeks, it's been a while, we've, we've been going through the ecclesia, uh, ecclesiastical <laughs> study and look at some of the key aspects of what is the church? I hope this morning that this message has made it more personal to you and of great significance of what you belong to and what has been given to you personally as a member of the true church of Jesus Christ. Just these five key aspects of that in the church. Doesn't the above verse here from Ephesians have great weight and meaning according to the power at work within us. This is happening right now in the true church of Jesus Christ. Right now, it's God's power in his church that is true and that his body, all the members are being kept by his power in the church for the church that is healthy, and sustained by him, despite all our struggles, and despite all the weaknesses that we have, sometimes I, my faith is strong, sometimes my faith is weak, it doesn't depend on me, it's his power that is keeping us, it's by his grace, and by his goodness towards us, who are the church, and this is personal, eternal and great significance to you and I, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for these great and precious promises of your word. You have said these things, not us. All these things have been determined by you, not by us. All power upon the members of your church is of you, and it's not the power of the members that hold us together. Lord, we thank you for what you've done 
and what you continue to do and what you have promised will be and be maintained for all eternity until we enjoy that great inheritance that's been promised in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be encouraged this morning. Well, whatever we may be going through or struggling with, may your words be true and may we block out all the lies that often entertain our minds. Lord, we are yours and you are ours. Lord, this is great personal significance to us for all eternity and we worship you in spirit and truth because beside you there is none else. We thank you for your work upon our lives, though we don't deserve it. We thank you for it all and what Jesus has done on the cross when he said, it is finished. We thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.